Chapter 8 of Trails End. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeff Chestnut. Trails End by George W. Ogden. Chapter 8 The Avatism of a Man. Morgan knew that the cogs of the slow machinery by which he had been hoisted from the saddle to the professorial chair had slipped. As he lay there on his back in the shallow ripple of the Arkansas River, the long centipede railroad bridge, dark lined across the broad stream, he turned it in his mind and knew that it was so. He had gone back in that brief time of terrific torture to the plane from which he had risen by hard and determined effort to make of himself a man in the world of consequence and achievement back to the savagery of the old days when he rode the range in summer glare and winter storm for it was his life's one aim and intention now to rise from that cool bed in the river presently and go back to ascalon try by sound of voice those who had subjected him to this torture separating by that test his heroic friend from the guilty the others he intended to kill man by man down to the last unfeeling brute the water was not more than two or three inches deep where he lay but a little way beyond he could hear it passing with greater volume among the spiles of the bridge fortune had spared him a fall into the deeper channel where even a foot of water might have drowned him strengthless and fettered as he was fate had reserved him for this hour of vengeance he turned wallowing in the shallow water to soak the rawhide rope which was already growing soft the pressure and pain of it considerably eased on his arms he drank and buried his face in the tepid water grateful for life exulting in the fierce fire that rose in him triumphing already in the swift atonement he would call on those wretches to make back again to the ethical standard of those old hard-riding hard-drinking hard-swearing days on the range the refinements of his education submerged and not one regret for the slip morgan did not realize in that moment of surrender to the primitive desires which clamored within him how badly he was wrenched and mauled he tried the rawhide swelling his bound arms in the hope that the slip knot would give a little but was unable to bring pressure enough on the rope to ease it in the least. Eager to begin his harvest of revenge before the men from the Nueces struck south again over the long trail, Morgan determined to start at once in search of somebody to free him from his bonds. He could not return to Ascalon in this shameful plight, his ignominy upon him an object of derision there must be somebody living along the river close at hand who would cut his bonds and give him a plaster to stick over the wound he could feel drawing and gaping in his cheek when it came to getting to his feet morgan learned that his desire had outgrown his strength a sickness swept him as he struggled to his knees blood burst from his nostrils the taste of blood was on his tongue dizzy sick to the core of his heart sore with a thousand bruises shot with a thousand pains which set up with every movement like the clamor of harassing wolves he dragged himself on his knees to the edge of the water where he lay on his face in the warm sand he waited there a long time for the gathering of strength enough to carry him on his quest of a friendly hand only the savage determination to strike his enemies down head by head kept him from perishing as he lay there sore and bruised chilled to the marrow in his welling agony even that hot summer night dawn was breaking when he at last found strength to mount the low bank through the encumbering brush and vines his arms were senseless below the elbows swollen almost to bursting of veins and skin by the gorged blood there was no choice in directions only to avoid the town he faced up the river and trudged on, the cottonwood leaves beginning their everlasting symphony that is like the murmur of rain as the wakening wind moved them overhead. 
Morgan stumbled over tin cans at the edge of the tall grass when the rising sun was shining across his unprotected eyes. He stood for a little while, wondering at first sight if this were only another mirage of the plagued imagination such had risen like ephemera while he lay on the sandbar at the river's edge. He stood with weak legs braced wide apart to fix his reeling senses on the sight, the amazing comforting sight of a field of growing corn. Only a little field, more properly a patch, but it was tall and green, in full tassel, the delicate sweet of its blossoms strung on the dew-damp morning. Beyond the field he could see the roof of a sod house, and a little of the brown wall that rose not much higher than the corn. Grass had grown on the roof, for it was made of strips of sod also, and turned sere and brown in the sun. A wire fence stood a prickly barrier between roaming cattle and this little field of succulent fodder. Morgan directed his course to skirt the field and came at last to the cabin door. In front of the house there was no fence, but a dooryard that seemed to embrace the rest of the earth. Around the door the ground was trampled and bare. In front of the house three horses stood, saddled and waiting, bridle reins on the ground. It looked like a cow camp to Morgan. It seemed as if he had come back home. A dog rose slowly from where it lay across the door, bristles rising, foot lifted as if the creature paused between flight and attack, setting up such an alarm that the horses bolted a little way and stood wondering. A woman came to the door, lifted her hands in silent astonishment, leaning a little to see. "'Heavens above! Look at that man!' she cried, her words sounding as from a great distance in Morgan's dulling ears. Morgan saw her start toward him running. He tried to step forward to meet her, but only his body moved in accord with his will. The earth seemed to rise and embrace him, letting him down softly as the arms of a friend. It was a new pain that brought Morgan to his senses, the pain of returning life to his half-dead arms. Somebody was standing beside him, holding these members raised to let the blood drain out of them, chafing them, and there was a smell of camphor and strong spirits in the place. The rope wouldn't have slipped down if they was trying to hang him anyhow, somebody said with conclusive finality. Looks like they lassoed him and drug him, another said, full of the awe that hushes the human voice when one stands beside the dead. Whoever done it ought to be skinned alive, a woman declared, and Morgan thanked her in his heart for her sympathy, although there was a weight of such absolute weakness on his eyes that he could not open them to see her face. There was a dim sound of something being stirred in a glass, and the nerve-waking scent of more ardent spirits. "'If this don't fetch him too,' said the voice of this first speaker, the deep pectoral tone of a seasoned man, "'you jump your horse and go for the doctor, Fred.' Morgan shook his head to throw that obstinate weight from his eyes, or thought he shook it, but it was only a shadow of a movement. Slight as it was, it brought an exclamation of relief in another voice, a woman's voice, also, tuned in the music of youth. "'Oh, he moved,' she said, and she was the one who stood beside him, holding the loft and chafing his blood-gorged arm. "'Blamed if he didn't. Here, try a little of this, son.' Morgan was gathering headway out of the fog so rapidly now that he began to feel ashamed of this helpless situation in which so many kind hands were ministering to him as if he were a sick horse. He made a more determined effort to open his eyes, succeeding this time, although it seemed to call for as much strength to lift his lids as to shoulder a sack of wheat. He saw a large hand holding a spoon hovering near his mouth and the outline of big shoulders in a red shirt. Morgan swallowed what was offered him to feel it go tingling through his nerves with vivifying warmth, like a message of cheer over a telegraph wire. The large man who administered the dose was delighted. He spoke encouragingly, working the spoon faster, as a man blows eagerly when he sees a flame start weakly in a doubtful fire. The woman with the voice of youth, who stood on Morgan's left hand, gently put his arm down, as if modesty would no longer countenance this office of tenderness to a conscious man. 
Any feelin' in your hands? The man inquired, bending a whiskered face down near Morgan's. Plenty of it, thank you, Morgan replied, his voice stubborn as a rusty hinge. You'll be all right, then. There's no bones broken as far as I can locate em. You just stretch out and take it easy. You'll be all right. I gave up. I gave up. Too easy, Morgan said, slowly like a very tired man. Land's alive! Gave up! said the matron of the household, who still held Morgan's arm up to drain off the congested blood. Look at your face! Look at your feet! Gave up! Land's alive! You're busted up pretty bad, old feller, said a young man who seemed to appear suddenly at Morgan's feet, where he stood looking down with the most friendly and a feeling expression imaginable in his wholesome brown face. That cut on your face ain't deep. It could be closed up and stuck with strips of plaster and only leave a shallow scar, but it ought to be done while it's fresh, the boss of the ranch said. I'd be greatly obliged to you, Morgan told him by way of agreement to the dressing of his wound. By the time the pioneer of the Arkansas had treated his mysteriously injured patient's hurts, Morgan had come to himself completely. He was relieved to know that his collapse at the threshold of that hospitable home was due to the suffering of his bound arms rather than any internal rupture or concussion as he first feared already his thoughts were running forward his blood was pounding in his arteries in vengeful eagerness to take up the trail of the men who had subjected him to this inhuman ordeal he could not hope to repay them cruelty for cruelty for he was not a man who did much crippling when it came to handling a gun but if he had to follow them to the nueces even to the rio grande for his toll then he would follow the business that had brought him into the kansas plains could wait there was but one big purpose in his life now he was eager to be up with the weight of a certain dependable pistol in his holster the feel of a certain rifle in its scabbard on the saddle under his knee sore and bruised as he was sore that he would be tomorrow Morgan wanted to get up as soon as the long, rough cut on his cheek had been comfortably patched with the adhesive tape. He asked the rancher if he would oblige him with a horse to go to Ascalon, where his trunk, containing his much-needed wardrobe, was still in the baggage room at the depot. "'You couldn't ride to Ascalon this morning, son,' the rancher told him, severely kind. "'You'll do if you can make it in a week,' the young man added his opinion cheerfully. Yes, and then some, the way it looks to me, the elder declared. Morgan started as if to spring from the low couch where they had laid him when they carried him in, dusty and bloody, fearful and repulsive sight of maimed flesh and torn clothing that he was. I can't stay a week. I can't wait a day. They'll be gone, man, he said. Maybe they will, son, the rancher agreed, gently pushing him back. Maybe, but they'll leave tracks yes by god they'll leave tracks morgan muttered don't you think i'd better send my boy over to town for the doctor the rancher asked not unless you're uneasy about me no your head's all right and your bones are whole you'll heal up but it'll take some time morgan said he felt that more had been done for him already than any number of doctors could have accomplished for the service had been one of humanity with no thought of reward they would let the doctor stay in ascalon and morgan would go to him if he felt the need coming on the rancher disclaimed credit for a service such as one man owed another the world over he said but it was plain that he was touched by the outspoken gratitude of this wreckage of humanity that had come halting in bonds to his door i'm a stranger to this country morgan explained I arrived in Ascalon yesterday. Pausing to ponder it, thinking it must have been longer than a day ago. Yesterday, with conviction. A little afternoon. Morgan is my name. I came here to settle on land. You're the man that took the new marshal's gun away from him, the rancher said, nodding slowly. My daughter knew you the minute she saw you. She was over there yesterday after the mail. Morgan's heart jumped. He looked about the room for her, but
but she and her mother had withdrawn. "'I guess I made a mistake when I mixed up with him,' Morgan said, as if he excused himself to the absent girl. "'The only mistake you made was when you handed him back his gun. You ought to have handed it back to a corpse,' the rancher said. "'We knew that feller he killed,' the younger man explained, with a world of significance in his voice. He used to live up here in this country before he went to Abilene. He'd come back to blow his money in Ascalon, I guess, the rancher said. He was one of them harmless bluffin' boys you could take by the ear and lead around like he had a ring in his nose. That's what I told them, Morgan commented in a thoughtful, distracted way. You sized him up right. He wouldn't have pulled his gun, quick as he was to slap his hand on it and run a sandy. I guess it was just as well it happened to him then as some other time. Somebody was bound to kill him when he got away among strangers. The rancher, who introduced himself as Stillwell, asked for the details of the killing, which Morgan gave, together with the trivial thing that led up to it. The big rancher sighed, shaking his head sadly. You ought to took his gun away from him and bent it around his fool head, he said. It would have been better for him and for me, I guess, Morgan agreed. Yes, that marshal was pretty sore on you for taking his gun away from him right out in public, it looks like, the rancher suggested, a bit in his manner for the details of his misfortune which Morgan felt were his by right of hospitality. I ran into some of his friends later on. He'd turned the town over to them, a bunch of cow-punchers just up from the Nueces. The rancher started at the word, exchanging a startled, meaning look with his son. "'That outfit that loaded over at Ascalon yesterday?' he inquired. "'Yes. Seven or eight of them stayed behind to look after the horses. Eight with the marshal. He's one of the outfit.' "'Did them fellers rope you and drag you away out here?' Stillwell inquired, leaning over in the tensity of his feeling, his tanned face growing pale, as if the thought of such atrocity turned his blood cold. They hitched me to a freight train. The rope broke at the river. The rancher turned to his son again, making a motion with open hand outflung, as if displaying evidence in some controversy between them that clinched it on his side without another word. The younger man came a step nearer Morgan's couch, where he stood with grave face, hesitant, as if something came forward in his mind to speak. The elder strode to the door and looked out into the sun of early morning, and the cool shadows of the cottonwood trees at the riverside which reached almost to his walls. "'To the train! God Almighty! To a train!' Morgan heard him say. How far is it from Ascalon to the river? Morgan asked. Over two miles, and your hands tied. God Almighty! You take it easy. They'll not leave Ascalon till Sol Drum, their boss, comes back from Kansas City, the young man said. We're laying for him ourselves. We've got a bill against him. And we've got about as much show to collect it as if we have to dip a hatful of stars out of the river. Stillwell said, turning gloomily from the door. "'We'll see about that,' the younger one returned, in high and defiant stubbornness. "'We've already lost upwards of five hundred head of stock from that feller's trespass on our range,' Stillwell explained. "'That gang drove in here three weeks ago to rest and feed up for market, paying no attention to anybody's range or anybody's warning to keep off. They had the men with them to go where they pleased.' Them Texas cattle come up here loaded with fever ticks, and the bite of them little bugs means death to a northern herd. They sowed ticks all over my range. I'm still a-losing cattle, and Lord knows where it'll stop. You've been working to get a quarantine law passed. I remember, Morgan said, feeling this outrage as if the cattle were his own. Yes, but Congress is asleep, and them fellers down in Texas never shut their eyes. I warned Drum to keep off my range, ask him first like a gentleman, but he drove in one night between my pickets and mixed his poison cattle with mine out of pure cussedness. He claimed they got away, and him with fifteen or twenty men to ride herd. It's cost me ten thousand dollars at the lowest figure already, and more going. It looks like it would clean me out. 
"'You ought to have some recourse against him in law,' Morgan said. "'Yes, I thought so, too. I went to the county attorney and wanted to bring an attachment on Drum's herd, but he told me there wasn't any law he could act under. It was anybody's range as much as mine, Texas fever or no Texas fever. I could sue him, he said, but it was a slim chance. Well, I'm going to see another lawyer. I'll take it up with Judge Thayer and see what he can do. Drum will pay it down to the last dime, the young man declared. We can't hold him up and take it away from him, Fred, the older man reproved. That would be as big a crime as his. He'll pay it, Fred repeated with what Morgan thought to be admirable tenacity, even though his means to the desired end might be hard to justify. They helped Morgan to another room, where they outfitted him with clothing to replace his own shredded garments. Stillwell insisted that he remained as his guest until his hurts were mended, although, he explained, he could not stay at home to keep him company. His wife and daughter would talk his arm off without help from the rest of the family. He would call them in and introduce them. "'My girl's got a new piano. Lucky I sent for it before that Texas outfit struck this range. She can try it out on you,' Stillwell said, a laugh still left in him for an amusing situation in spite of the ruin he faced. Morgan could hear the girl and her mother talking in the kitchen their voices quite distinct at times as they passed an open door that he could not see. Lame and aching, hands swollen and purple, he sat in a rocking chair by the open window, not so broken by his experiences nor so depressed by his pains, but he yet had the pleasure of anticipation of meeting this girl. He had determined only a few hours ago that the country was not big enough to hide her from him. Now, Fate had jerked him with rough hand to the end of his quest before it was fairly begun. As he thought this, Stillwell came back, convoying his ample red-faced wife, and almost as ample and quite as red-faced daughter. So there must have been more than one young lady after the mail in Ascalon yesterday afternoon, thought Morgan, as he got up ruefully with much pain in his feet and ankles, rather shamed and taken back and bowed the best way he could to this girl who was not his girl, after all his eager anticipation. End of chapter 8 Recording by Jeff Chestnut